All right. Good evening. My name is Eric Carpio. I'm, I'm with History Colorado. Um, I'm uh, the director of the Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center and also our chief community museum officer for History Colorado. Tonight's event is part of History Colorado's Borderlands of Southern Colorado online lecture series offered by History Colorado Community Museums, El Pueblo History Museum, the Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center, Trinidad History Museum, and the Ute Indian Museum. Before we begin tonight's program, in the spirit of healing and education, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribes with historic ties to the state of Colorado. These tribes are our partners. We consult with them when we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, do archeological work, and create educational programs. We recognize these indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this land. As always, I'd like to thank the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area and Colorado State University Pueblo for their continued support of our lecture series. History Colorado members can deepen their involvement in, and support of our Borderlands of Southern Colorado initiative by, enjoy, by joining Fronteras, the Borderlands of Southern Colorado Society. By making a contribution to join Fronteras, you are connecting to others who share your special interest in the understanding and scholarship of the Borderlands region of Southern Colorado. Tonight's talk is When Colorado Was Apache Country, Why the History of Indigenous Homelands and Borderlands Matters, presented by Dr. Paul Conrad. Uh, Dr. Conrad is an assistant professor of history at the University of Texas Arlington, and he has strong connections to Southern Colorado from his time as a professor at Colorado State University Pueblo. His book, The Apache uh, Diaspora, Four Centuries of Displacement and Survival um, is released or set to be released in just a few weeks. Uh, Paul, welcome. It's great to have you join us this evening. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, uh, thanks to you and everyone at History Colorado for inviting me to speak. Um, and first and foremost, thanks to all of you who are here uh, for joining in this evening um, to hear what I have to say. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and and uh, pull up my presentation um, and and get started. Um, I, I look forward to your comments and questions. So um, if any questions come up as I'm speaking, please feel free to type them in the chat. Um, and of course, at the end, I'll look forward to calling on anyone who wants to raise their hand um, and ask questions that way as well. Um, so give me one second here and I will get started. All right, um, so just, just again, it's an honor to be with you to talk talk to you about when Colorado was Apache country um, and other stories from the Apache diaspora. And I'll explain in just a minute what I mean by that. Um, so I wanna start my talk today actually with a poster um, that I first saw back in October on Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, as with other historically oppressed groups in US society, Indigenous peoples have fought for recognition of all kinds, including recognition of a day and a month um, to, to honor their history. Um, but in, in my view, every day can, can be Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, and we shouldn't just wait for October um, or November <laughs> um, to um, ask ourselves questions um, and learn more about Indigenous history. Um, so, um, this poster raises, I think, a number of important questions that we should all ask ourselves wherever we're joining from. I saw in the chat that there's people from all over Colorado um, and also beyond Colorado. Um, so I want to ask you to take just a minute to think about which of these questions um, you know the answer to. Um, and this actually builds nicely, I think, upon what Eric was just saying in terms of history, uh, Colorado's acknowledgments of um, both the indigenous peoples of Colorado and their partnerships with uh, the indigenous peoples of Colorado. So whose land do you live on? What do or did they call themselves? What was done to them? How do you benefit from that? Um, these are important questions. And if we were in person <laughs> and not uh, meeting through this, unfortunately, somewhat awkward technology, I would pause now to ask some of you um, to share um, what you know um, about these answers. Um, but uh, I will share just briefly that I am in North Texas. I'm coming to you from North Texas. Um, and I'm on the lands of the ancestors of today's Wichita and affiliated tribes. Um, who called themselves Kitish, uh, which means raccoon-eyed people. 
Um, and they were violently displaced from this region um, by white settlers um, beginning in the era um, of the Texas Republic. Um, and their contemporary nations are now headquartered um, in Oklahoma. Um, so these questions posed um, in this poster, I think highlight an important truth about the history of the Americas, that wherever you are, someone else was living there before you. Um, and it's important and worthwhile for you to know something about their stories. Um, indigenous peoples had deep ties to specific landscapes, sacred uh, spaces and places, uh, where some believe they had emerged into the world, where their ancestors had lived and died for countless generations. But as important as these questions on this poster are, I think there's also some important histories and themes not captured by them. So I saw some of you are in Denver um, uh, from the chat. And for those of you in Denver, perhaps you've visited the Denver Indian Center, perhaps you've attended events there. Um, citizens of dozens of different tribes have, have met and interacted at places like the Denver Indian Center. Or maybe, I didn't see anyone, but maybe you're near me in Dallas, Texas. Maybe you get your health care at a place like the Urban Intertribal Center here in Dallas, uh, which serves citizens of over a hundred different tribal nations. The contemporary presence of indigenous peoples in these communities, places like Denver and Dallas, is rooted in histories of migration, um, in some cases forced migration. And this dynamic, this history of mobility, migration, adaptation is not new to the 20th or 21st centuries. What I'd like to show you in my presentation today is that the history of indigenous peoples in Colorado and beyond Colorado is not only a history about homelands, even if homelands are important, it's also fundamentally also about histories of separation, displacement, adaptation, and sometimes for some groups return, often uh, from across long distances. There's a word for this, uh, this, this theme in history that I admit is a somewhat awkward word. Um, I think, uh, I don't want to call Eric out, but I think he may have uh, kind of hesitated or stumbled a bit on it. I think I have myself. Uh, my mom does whenever she tries to say the title of my book. Um, but um, it's a word that I think captures well um, these themes in, in, in the history of indigenous peoples that I think we need to know more about, especially when we're talking about the context of colonialism and indigenous peoples experiences of colonialism. And that word is diaspora. By paying attention to histories of indigenous diasporas, we have to reckon with not only the dispossession of indigenous peoples from their traditional homelands, but also the experiences of those sent away, displaced from home, uh, who had uh, to find a way to live in new foreign places. Um, they learned how to make these new places home, um, often in difficult circumstances, not of their own choosing. And this is a key part of the story that I tell in my book that, as Eric said, um, was published um, this month. Um, so, uh, to show you what I mean uh, about diaspora being important in the history of indigenous peoples. Um, and in my own work, I focus especially on Apache history. Um, what I wanna do today is take you on something of a tour. Um, this is maybe an advantage of meeting virtually. I can take you on a, at least a virtual tour um, of a few important places in North America in the Caribbean and also yes, Colorado. Um, from the vantage point of Apache history. Think of this um, as a kind of snapshot um, of some broader histories that you would learn about um, if you dare to try to make your way through reading my book or other books that have also talked about some of these histories. Um, and in taking you on a tour of these specific places, um, my focus on place is intentional. 
Um, place is incredibly important in Apache understandings of their own history. The stories that they tell about what happened in particular places serve to them as a reminder of what it means to be Apache, of important Apache values, um, and of the, of the endurance, vitality, and capabilities of their ancestors that came before them. The sites that I've selected for you today are not places that I think many of you probably would normally think of um, as specifically Apache places. Um, for example, if you, if you think back to that poster with which I began, um, and asked about whose lands these sites are on, Apache might not be among the names of indigenous peoples that would, that would register for you. But I'd like to make the case for you today that we should think of these sites as at least in part Apache places. Um, and in doing so, I'd like to explore with you some of the, the implications, some of the lessons um, of thinking about them as such. And so to guide us on our tour of these select um, important places in Apache history and the history of the Apache diaspora, um, I'd like to propose a few broader questions for us to consider at each site. Um, and these questions build off the poster, the Indigenous Peoples Day poster with which I began, but, but they broaden, I think, the scope a little bit to allow for these kinds of histories of forced migration of diaspora that I think are also um, so important in the broader history of indigenous peoples in the Americas. Um, so at each site, um, we'll pause to think about who used to live there, um, what happened to them and what their stories teach us. Um, and in a broader way, I, I would pose that these questions um, are useful to think about at any place you go, any building, any site, um, any community, um, any region. Um, these are questions that I think it's useful for us to pause um, and, and think about. All right, um, let's get started. So our first stop um, takes us a, a few hundred miles south of present day Colorado um, to a palace um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico built in the 16 teens. I have a feeling that um, at least some of you perhaps have been here. Um, this is um, the palace of the governors um, in Santa Fe. This is a contemporary photograph um, of this site. Um, and uh, there are other palaces that I could take you to that were important in Apache history. But this is um, one of the most important ones early on in Apache people's experiences of colonialism, beginning, of course, after um, the arrival of the Spanish um, in the region, um, in invasions, incursions, beginning in the 1500s. And then, of course, the, the Spanish come to stay with Don Juan de Oñate's conquest in 1598. Um, and uh, within a decade or so, they've built um, this palace um, in Santa Fe. Um, so who lived here? What happened to them? Um, and what historical lessons um, can this place teach us? Well, on the one hand, um, it tells a story of shifting colonial rulers and of native resistance to them. Um, in focusing on this site, on, in this building, uh, we can learn about shifts between Spanish, Pueblo, Mexican, and U.S. rule. Um, but I am less interested in the stories of governors um, and rulers um, than I am in other people that lived inside this palace, especially the people who did the work. Uh, the palace of the governors can teach us lessons, for example, about the centrality of slavery to the history of many sites across the Americas. Um, while also reminding us of the varied origins and ethnicities of those people who experienced human bondage historically. Um, at the Palace of the Governors, there were hundreds of servants and slaves of, of native and African descent who spent time within these walls in the centuries after it was built. They cooked, they cleaned, they ran errands, they maintained the building, they fell in love, they gave birth, they faced physical and mental abuse, and sometimes they escaped and returned home. This is a diagram of the palace in the period, more specifically, that I'm going to tell you a little bit more about um, in the mid-1600s. 
Um, and I realize um, it might be a little difficult to make out all the details of the rooms, but um, uh, you can, uh, if you look carefully, you can make out uh, administrative buildings where governors did their business, meeting halls, storerooms, warehouses. Um, but I would point you to the, the rooms on the upper right, at least it's on my upper right. I'm not sure exactly how it appears to you, um, but where you can see um, the servants' quarters. Um, and it's in those spaces in particular um, where Apache uh, and other uh, native um, and enslaved African people um, lived out their lives. From the history of this palace and the political machinations that surrounded the governors that occupied it, we also learn more specifically about how Apache history and the history of slavery in what is now New Mexico and Colorado were inseparable. And one of the important lessons about the history of slavery in this region that we can learn is about the very roots and use of the term Apache. Apache, um, like many other tribal names with which you may be familiar, is what we call an exonym. It's a name that outsiders gave to that group rather than its own name for itself in its own language. Uh, this term Apache, uh, meaning something like enemy in the Zuni language, um, developed a similar connotation, enemy, um, in Spanish usage. Not coincidentally, from a Spanish perspective, um, in the 15 and 1600s, pagan heathen enemies of Catholicism in the Spanish crown were generally people deemed enslavable, at least for some period of time, despite official laws to the contrary. Let's take a look at one Spanish governor's decree to help to illustrate um, this point. Um, so this is a little snapshot, a little snippet of a decree that Governor Don Juan Manso issued um, from Santa Fe, from the Palace of the Governors um, in the 1650s. Um, and he described in this decree that um, he'd issued um, what he termed a definitive sentence of death in just war um, against the entire nation of Apache Indians. Um, and that as a result, um, they could be distributed to labor uh, for a period of 15 years. And he goes on to describe that they could be exported from the kingdom of New Mexico. And if they were exported, they, uh, they were never allowed or should never be allowed to return um, to their homelands um, in this area. So um, there's a lot <laughs> that we could unpack um, from uh, this uh, governor's decree. There's a, a lot of interesting things here about just war and his vision um, and those of other Spaniards of this era of slavery as somehow a kind of merciful alternative to death in war. Um, but what I actually wanna point you to first and foremost is something else, his description of this entire nation of Apaches, this idea that there was one Apache nation. In fact, Apaches understood and continue to understand themselves um, in much uh, closer knit ways. Uh, based on kinship, um, on place of residence, um, among some groups based on clans. Um, and they didn't have a sense of themselves as being one united nation, either in the past or in the present. The 19th century Chocoan Apache leader Cochise, for example, perhaps some of you have heard of Cochise before. Um, he knew himself as uh, the Nantan, uh, the chief or spokesperson uh, for the families that formed his local group. Um, in the Apache language, uh, these local groups were called Gota. This group had a name based on its favorite camping spot in the Dragoon Mountains of what is now southeastern Arizona um, uh, called Biatsia, meaning there is a clearing on its summit. Together with other local groups linked through kinship in the broader region, Cochise's people formed a larger band the Chocoininde, or Juniper people, labeling many groups surrounding New Mexico as one Apache nation, despite the reality of diversity, was on the part of Spaniards, a strategic invention, a useful lie designed to ensure that a supply of slave labor would be abundant. 
Let's take a look at an early 18th century Spanish map that helps to illustrate my point. Um, and I like this map for a few reasons. One is that unlike more modern maps, uh, it portrays the boundaries of New Mexico, Nuevo Mexico, as uh, Spaniards themselves kind of understood it. Um, they recognized at the time that they actually controlled a relatively narrow swath of land along the Rio Grande, um, not a much larger territory um, that you may have seen claimed in other maps created later. Um, and I'd also just like to point out to you that, um, you know, around that relatively narrow swath of land that they're describing as Nuevo Mexico, you see lots of Tierra de los Apaches, right? Um, this map is portraying New Mexico as being surrounded by uh, Apaches, just as governors like Don Juan Manso argued in saying that because we're surrounded by rebellious Apaches, we need to wage war on them and enslave them, and we therefore can uh, are justified in taking them to places like the Palace of Governors and putting them to work. Now, a focus on the lives of natives in places like the Palace of the Governors also adds another dimension to the term Apache. So I've just tried to kind of explain and lay out how it's, a, um, it's an exonym, it's a, a term applied to Apaches by outsiders, it's a term that became important to Spaniards as a kind of uh, generalization that allowed them to enslave all these people that surrounded them, regardless of how they viewed themselves, how those people viewed themselves. But I'd like to also point out that for those people that were captured and, and, and enslaved, often quite young children, um, the term Apache also became meaningful to them over time. Um, so for some older captives, so you, if you were an adult captured and put to work in a place like the Palace of the Governors, um, and you're called Apache day in and day out, um, we can think of this as a kind of double consciousness. Some of you may have heard of this term before from the context of African-American history. Um, uh, what this means is that, you know, from they learn to recognize themselves, certainly based on how they understood themselves in their own language, but they also came to recognize themselves based on how their masters understood them um, as Apaches. Um, but for, for young children who didn't recall their place of birth, who had only remembered being in captivity, being enslaved. Uh, for them, Apache became a meaningful kind of term for them to recognize who they were and to identify with others around them that uh, they thought might be similar, might have similar origins. Uh, So-called Apaches, I've learned through my research, um, in places like Santa Fe, and um, many were also shipped south into what's now Mexico, um, was uh, known as New Spain at the time. Um, in these places in diaspora, they very often married other Apaches. They often chose other Apaches as godparents. This isn't a coincidence. I think they developed and maintained a new group consciousness in diaspora in part as a, as a survival strategy, as they learned who they could trust, who was like them, um, in these difficult circumstances of forced labor. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but we know about this in part from Catholic church records. And um, this is a, a marriage record from a community in what's now Northern Mexico um, that describes the marriage of an Apache man named Domingo, an, an Apache woman um, named Dortea. Um, and their marriage was uh, witnessed by their godparents um, who were also native servants um, in the community. Um, so this kind of experience of living and interacting with others in diaspora, forming families with other displaced natives, um, this is a, a, a part of the history of the Apache diaspora that I talk about um, in my book. All right. It's time to move on. <laughs> I would love to answer more questions about the experience of Apache peoples in places like Santa Fe in the 17th century, but I'd like to, to move on now to the next stop on our tour. Um, and this uh, stop leads us to a river. Um, just as there are many other palaces that I could have taken to you to, there are many other rivers uh, that were important um, in Apache history. Uh, but uh, I chose one based on 
the fact that I'm speaking to many of you um, who are in Colorado, some of you in Southern Colorado. Um, and some of you may be familiar with the history, the indigenous history of Southern Colorado, but some of you may not be. Um, and if you are in a place like present day Pueblo, Colorado, looking at the Arkansas River, known historically by many other names, including uh, by indigenous, some indigenous peoples as the Napestle River. Um, if you're looking out at that river, um, I would encourage you to think about who lived here, what happened to them, um, and what lessons their histories um, teach us. Uh, and if we go back in time uh, to the 1600s and uh, the early 1700s, uh, what's now the Arkansas River of Southern Colorado uh, was inhabited by Apache peoples, by agricultural Apache village villagers um, that uh, benefited from the reliable waters of the Arkansas River um, and farmed uh, corn, beans, squash, and other crops um, in, um, along, in and along um, its banks. Um, much of what we know about these Apache villages that once dotted Southern Colorado comes from Spanish expeditions north into the area. Um, after the Pueblo Revolt of, the, of 1680, that some of you may be familiar with when, at least temporarily, the Pueblo and their allies kicked the Spanish out of New Mexico um, and uh, for a period of time regained their independence. Um, but after the Spanish reconquest of New Mexico, um, the Spanish sent uh, an expedition led by Juan de Ulibarri north um, into southern Colorado, in part to recover Pueblo refugees um, who had escaped the reconquest um, to live among Apaches um, in southern Colorado um, instead. Um, and from his expedition, we learn um, about um, the Apache peoples and um, villages of that time. Uh, and uh, we also learn about some of their growing concerns uh, during the early 1700s. Um, as Ulibarri traveled north in 1706, he described um, overtaking an Apache family uh, near a stream in present day Southern Colorado. Uh, and a man, an Apache man reported through an interpreter that that they were going to join other villages in the area in order to defend themselves together from the Utes and Comanches who were coming to attack them. The next day near present day Pueblo, Colorado, uh, this exped Spanish expedition came across a woman and a girl who were gathering wild cherries on the Arkansas River. And they repeated the same news of an impending Apache attack. This expedition left, uh, retreated, um, and a decade or so later, another Spanish expedition returned. Um, and they discovered that in fact, uh, Apache fears of Comanches and Utes overrunning their village were well-founded. Um, and they discovered that, in, that Comanches and Utes had been overrunning these villages for some years, attacking them and, and capturing women and children to transport to places like New Mexico to sell um, as slaves. Uh, they were also selling some of them to French traders that had increasingly begun traveling down the Mississippi River um, and into the central plains of North America. Um, here's an image, <laughs> a present day image. Uh, I meant to actually show you a little bit earlier when I was talking about the Arkansas River um, of, of course, the Riverwalk um, in Pueblo. Uh, where at least when I lived there, you could there was a plaque that where you could learn more about the various empires and nation states that have claimed the Arkansas River as, as a border over time. Um, but at least when I was there, it didn't tell anything about the Apache history that I'm introducing to you today. Uh, so uh, I was talking about when the Spanish uh, returned on an expedition in 1719, and uh, they discovered, you know, that Apaches were being displaced by Comanches and Utes. Um, and this is what a Gulgahenende, a Hickory Apache emissary, um, explained to the Spanish through an interpreter. He said they were very sad and discouraged um, because of the repeated attacks which their enemies, the Utes and Comanches, make upon them. Uh, these had killed many of their nation uh, and carried off their women and children as captives until they no longer knew where to go to live in safety. 
And it's the last part of that quote that has really stuck with me. They no longer knew where to go to live in safety. And this is a dynamic that's very specific to this moment when Comanches are displacing Apaches from you know, taking control of these river valleys um, and capturing and shipping Apaches off into slavery, in part to purchase more horses that help them to expand their power and further expand the reach of their trading networks onto the plains. Uh, so it's very specific to this time, but it's also a, a dynamic that I think echoes through Apache history and the history of some other native groups. These moments when they were facing displacement, the loss of a significant number of kins to for, kin to forced migration and, and enslavement. And they were trying to figure out what to do, where to go, um, where um, to live um, in safety. Um, so, uh, what do we learn uh, from this story uh, by looking at and looking out from the Arkansas River from the vantage point of Apache history? Well, I think one of the things we can learn from this moment in the early 1700s when Apache lands are becoming Comanche lands um, is that the effects of colonialism were very complex. Um, and colonialism had rippling effects that impacted relations between native groups as much as they as between natives and Europeans. For example, from the Comanche uh, story, we uh, and the story of Comanches displacing and enslaving Apaches, we can see that it was not just Europeans um, and Americans, Euro-Americans, who were imperial agents of forced migration, displacement, and enslavement. But I think it's also important to recognize that it was colonization itself that was at the root of many of these changes. Um, for example, uh, it was due to the labor demands of colonial societies that there was a market for Apache and other indigenous slaves to be circulated across the continent. Um, and during this period, there were um, Hickoria, you know, Plains Apaches that ended up in places as varied as the Pacific coast of Sonora um, and um, Montreal, Quebec. Um, there's even one Plains Apache woman that I know of uh, who was carried by her French master across the Atlantic to France. Uh, the frequent loss of these kin um, also had uh, influences on the communities left behind and their choices, as we saw uh, from uh, the quote of this Apache emissary. They sought to find new homes, some place to live in safety. And by the mid 18th century, um, Plains Apaches had found new homes, coalescing as uh, the Ollero and Llanero, the Sait Inde and Gugahen Inde bands of what is now the Hikaria Apache Nation of New Mexico. But as we will see, the struggles of Apache groups for autonomy, for family, and a safe place to live as Apaches were far from over. I wanna take you now uh, quickly uh, to the third stop on our tour. Um, and this stop is going to take us to a prison. Just as there are other rivers and other palaces that I could have shared histories about, shared stories about, there are other prisons that were important in Apache history um, that I could talk about. Um, but um, I wanna tell you a little bit about one that I think is especially um, especially horrifying, especially um, significant and interesting. And this prison is La Cabana, um, a fortification in Havana, Cuba, uh, originally built to protect the island from Spain's imperial foes um, in the 1760s. Uh, in a broader sense, however, I'd suggest that we can think of, at least from the vantage point of native history, of Apache history, of the island itself, the whole island of Cuba, as a kind of prison. Uh, at least that is how many Spanish officials conceived of it and talked about it uh, when they began deciding to send Apaches and other indigenous peoples from what is now northern Mexico and the U.S. Southwest to um, La Cabana and places on the island like it. Um, so what does looking at Apache history uh, and uh, the history of North America from the vantage point of a place like La Campania teach us. Um, what lessons do we learn from this place? On the one hand, learning that Apaches um, and uh, it was 
something around 500 Apaches uh, who in the 1780s and 1790s were transported to this prison um, and then distributed, at least some of them were distributed from there to labor at various sites and also in individual homes. Um, what do we learn from knowing about that history? Well, on the one hand, I think it's a remarkable reminder that more than 200 years after setting foot in Apache lands, the Spanish were still struggling to try to subjugate them. Um, and one Spanish military officer at the time explained this strategy of shipping Apaches to Cuba uh, into prisons like La Cabana. And this is what he had to say. So Colonel uh, Hugo O'Connor um, in a um, kind of military strategizing session, a war council um, in 1776, this is what he had to say uh, about envisioning Cuba as a destination for Apaches. He said, even if they are sent to workshops to, um, you know, think like textile factories, for example, um, in the capital, and he's meaning the capital uh, of Mexico, uh, Mexico City, even if they are sent to workshops in the capital, the Apache are so warlike, the men as well as the women, they can easily return to their homelands. It's only by transporting them to windward islands in small groups that we might ever see these frontiers free of these enemies. So after centuries of struggling to subjugate Apaches through warfare, through enslavement, through all these means, right? The, Apache, the Spanish are still struggling to do so and they're devising new creative schemes to try to make this happen. And Cuba and shipping Apaches to Cuba is one of the ways they imagine um, doing this. And so uh, they try it. <laughs> uh, and I think one of the things we learn from this Spanish experiment is uh, the profound disconnect between government policies, imperial policies, and the lived experience of people on the ground. Believe it or not, uh, the Spanish actually talked about and imagined this as, some, as a kind of humanitarian policy. Uh, um, in some ways echoing uh, the policy of enslaving rather than killing Apaches that um, I told you about in the 17th century. By the, in the 18th century, they're saying, you know, instead of killing Apaches in warfare, we're going to humanely treat them as prisoners of war and ship them uh, to Cuba instead. Um, but of course, the lived experience of these people uh, belies, you know, is quite different than uh, Spanish visions of humane treatment. Um, they generally journeyed from places like Chihuahua to Mexico City on foot. Many didn't survive that part of the journey. Then they often languished in prisons in Mexico City or on the Gulf Coast before finally uh, they were shipped, um, if they survived, on to Havana. Um, and uh, there are uh, examples of, of women, for example, as old as 90 years old. Uh, that endured this journey um, and were then imprisoned in sites like La Cabana, this prison in, uh, in Havana for periods of time. In the end though, a shipment to Cuba didn't solve Spaniards problems either. So Hugo O'Connor here, uh, his vision of uh, windward islands as the solution to Spanish problems with Apaches didn't end up proving to be a solution. Um, we know this because even after arriving in Havana, some Apaches were able to escape. Um, there's reports of them banding together with runaway enslaved Africans um, and raiding uh, ranches and sugar plantations in the countryside of Cuba. Um, some Spanish officials were desperately concerned about this, um, lobbying royal officials to stop sending Apaches to Havana because they were so concerned about the troubles they were causing. Um, and uh, uh, we also, um, there's also, you know, one report that sticks in my mind in particular of a uh, local official in Western uh, Cuba having at least temporarily recaptured some people that he believed were Apaches, um, who he explained uh, that they uh, somehow got across to him through signs uh, that they were looking for some way to embark from the island. Um, this is an example to me of the determination of Apaches, even after shipment overseas, to some somehow try to find a way to return home. Uh, and it wasn't just uh, Apaches shipped to Cuba that were still looking for a way to reconnect with their kin. Um, this is a list 
um, of relatives that Apaches were uh, petitioned in the, uh, this is in 1791, their Apache leaders are petitioning to get their relatives who had been shipped off a return to them. Uh, and uh, they're that carefully transcribing here their Apache names and describing them in the hopes that the Spanish will somehow, you know, give them back. Um, and this is just one of dozens of documents like this that I came across in my research in which Apaches are demanding, requesting, petitioning to try to get relatives back that had been shipped off by imperial officials or nations, you know, to some distant place. Um, now, even as some Apaches try to make it back home and uh, some Apaches who remain behind in their homelands are trying to get their relatives back, of course, I think it's important to recognize that many Apaches continued to live out their lives in diaspora, continue to labor, um, perhaps start families, have children in places like Cuba. And we should think about the fact that uh, their descendants are still living um, in places like Cuba and the broader Caribbean basin today. All right, I wanna move now to my final stop and then I'm looking forward uh, to your comments um, and questions. Um, and my final stop skips over a lot of important moments um, in Apache history. Um, but uh, for our, the final stop of our tour, I, I wanted to take us to a school um, and think about who lived at this school and what happened to them and what their stories tell us. Uh, just in the case of palaces, rivers, and prisons, there are many other schools that were important in Apache history that I could take you to, including uh, schools in Colorado, uh, places like the Fort Lewis Indian School. But um, I've chosen one school that I think was especially important in the both Apache history and the larger history of the US uh, Native American boarding school system. And that is the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. In, in Pennsylvania. Some of you may be familiar with this school already. Um, it was one of the first uh, schools founded, at least uh, the first boarding schools founded in the late uh, 1800s by the United States. Um, and it was an example of its founder, Richard Pratt's famous philosophy that you've probably heard quoted before, kill the Indian, save the man, an, an expression of the, the kind of cultural genocide that US policymakers envisioned happening um, in uh, these schools. Um, so what does knowing about um, a site uh, like the Carlisle Indian School and its history teach us about Apache history, Native American history, American history? Um, well, I think uh, one thing to know um, is um, of course, about the destructiveness of the boarding school system. Um, this is reflected in the quote I already mentioned, uh, kill the Indian, save the man. Um, but it's also reflected in specific stories that Apaches told about their time at Carlisle. Um, one such story that is ingrained in my mind is a story told uh, by an Apache man named Sam Kenoy. Um, and he was sent to Carlisle Indian School around 1898 um, and one of the memories that he recalled years later when he was um, asked to remember his time at boarding school uh, was not of the school buildings themselves. It wasn't of any education he received in the classroom, it was actually of other things he learned from beyond um, the classroom. For example, he remembered coming across the school cemetery pictured here on the lower right. Uh, he remembered walking amongst the graves and looking for relatives, the names of relatives in, um, on the, the headstones. And he remembered trying to count the graves. And he counted to 10, 20, 50. And he, he recalled that he got to about 100 before he lost count and got mixed up. Um, if he didn't remember the total number of graves precisely, he remembered the lessons that this cemetery taught him. Uh, as he put it, uh, the lesson was that very few people came back. Um, and I think that that lesson about the death and destruction wrought by the Indian boarding schools is an important lesson 
But there's also other historical lessons that we can learn, uh, both from uh, the story of people like Sam Kinoy and others like him, who not only learned lessons um, uh, at boarding school, but also you know, for those that survived and returned home uh, to their people and spread some of the lessons that they learned at boarding school back uh, to, their, to their kin. This is something that really struck me in my research about uh, Carlisle Indian School in particular. Um, I was struck by how, how often um, Apaches and other natives stayed in touch with their relatives. Uh, they wrote letters, sent telegrams, sent care packages back and forth um, to wherever their kin were living. And this is an especially interesting period for Apaches because uh, some of you who may know something about Apache history may know that um, after Geronimo, one of the most famous Apaches surrendered to the U.S. in 1886, um, all Chiricahua Apaches were transported as prisoners of war um, to Florida and then Alabama. Um, and many Apaches who were um, in their teens and 20s were then separated again from their relatives and sent to boarding schools. Uh, but uh, wherever their kin were living, whether it was as prisoners of war at forts in Florida or in Alabama, or later they get sent to Oklahoma, Apaches managed to stay in touch with each other and spread news back to their relatives. In fact, Apaches sometimes learned about events at Carlisle um, from their relatives who were there before they actually received word of important events uh, like marriages or deaths um, uh, from, from school officials. And in addition to staying connected with each other through letters and telegrams, um, uh, returning back to their kin on the railroad um, to visit them, in addition to these uh, kinds of strategies, um, the other thing, of course, is that almost universally, um, I can't think actually from a, a, the perspective of Apache history of a single counterexample to the fact that if people survived boarding school, they returned home to their communities. Um, they didn't, as US policymakers envisioned, stay in white society and labor in white society in factories or in other forms of manual labor, which is what these schools were supposed to train them to do. Um, uh, the other thing I would point out in terms of lessons that Apaches learned and other natives learned and spread back to their communities from their time at boarding school is the fact that many of these uh, students um, spent relatively little time at the school itself. Um, this photograph on the left is of a farm in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. This is where Sam Kinoy, the Apache man I told you about a few minutes ago, uh, who toured, who remembered uh, touring the cemetery. This is where Sam Kinoy spent almost all of his time actually. Um, he labored on farms in the countryside of Pennsylvania for various white farmers. Um, and he occasionally attended local public schools in that area. Um, the idea of people like Richard Pratt with, with, the, with this system, it was called the outing system, was that by um, separating native youths um, from not only their communities, their relatives, but also from each other, they would more easily be acculturated and their ties to, to native culture and native values would uh, be, be severed more easily if they were surrounded it through, uh, throughout their days uh, by white people. But Sam Kunoy remembered learning other lessons from his time of hard work uh, at farms like, like this one in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And this, this uh, recollection of Sam Kunoy has really stuck in my memory. Uh, he's talking about uh, his time uh, you know, in the countryside of Pennsylvania. And he's explaining how even there, he tried to stay connected with relatives and with other native um, students that he had met um, and by going to visit them once he learned about where their outing assignments were. Um, but he struggled to be able to do that uh, because as he put it, the white boys never let the Indians go anywhere in that country. If I went to see another Indian six miles away, I had to go through white boy country uh, and they would take after me and fight. 
that phrase, white boy country, uh, really sticks with me as a lesson that he learned uh, during his time at, at Carlisle. He's really describing here, learning about uh, race in America. He's describing learning about white supremacy uh, in America. Um, and that's a lesson that Sam Kinoy and others Apaches like him took back with him when he left the school uh, and returned to his people. Um, the education Sam Kinoy received at Carlisle or out in the countryside beyond the school uh, significantly influenced his life, but not in the way that US policymakers intended. He did become literate, he learned English, uh, but he used that knowledge and his knowledge of race and US governance and society um, to serve the interests of his people. Uh, he ran away from the school in 1901 um, and uh, was a stowaway on the railroad. It's a really fascinating story. He ends up, uh, by that time, his relatives were back in Oklahoma and he spent a little bit of time there before Apaches were finally released from prisoners of war status and able to decide where they could live. Um, he went to the Mescalero Reservation uh, in New Mexico. Uh, he used his, the, some of the skills he'd learned in Pennsylvania to be an interpreter and help uh, Apaches on the Mescalero Reservation to interpret legal documents. Uh, he then formed what he called the Chiricahua Business Committee. Uh, and he began a years long campaign to try to get Congress, the US Congress, to pass a bill to provide reparations to Apache people for their 27 years of internment as US prisoners of war. Um, it's a, it was really a bold and remarkable campaign uh, that he waged uh, to try to get um, some payment uh, for Apache people for their years of suffering. All right, I know I've, I've already probably talked too long in uh, my tour here of the Apache diaspora and these key sites in it. Uh, so I'll conclude. Um, what do I want you to take away from hearing about when the Arkansas River, when Colorado was Apache country and these other stories from the history of the Apache diaspora? Uh, well, I'll suggest two overarching points and then I look forward to your, your questions. I think one lesson that we can learn from this story, these histories is about the depth of colonialism in terms of time, of chronology. Um, in places like Colorado and the public schools, for example, I think the focus often on Native history is on a very particular moment, right? It's on the gold rush and U.S. settlement in the mid to late 19th century. But I think what we can learn here is that there's so much more to the story of uh, the colonization of Native peoples than just these singular moments of confrontation uh, between Native peoples uh, and, and U.S. or other um, settlers. Um, in terms of Apaches, for example, we're talking about centuries of time in terms of colonization from the 1500s to the present. I think another overarching lesson is about geography. Um, and this kind of brings me back to where I began with the poster and my kind of um, critique of some of the questions, or at least my suggestion that we should broaden out uh, from some of the, the questions. Um, so when we think uh, about native spaces, we often think of traditional homelands, cultural spaces re recognized as sacred, which are incredibly important. But I think we should think too about the many other spaces all across the Americas and even overseas where native people spent time due to colonialism, places like the Palace of the Governors, uh, the prison of La Cabana, the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. And in those, uh, in learning about those spaces, I think uh, we learn lessons about this loss, about suffering, about dispossession, destruction. But we also, I think, can find stories about native strength, resistance, um, adaptation, and in some cases, like Sam Kinoy's, return uh, to their people. Thank you. I look forward to, to your questions and comments. Paul, there was a lot of great discussion. Um, if it's helpful, I can, I've got some questions marked. I could read them for you. Yeah, that'd be great, Zach. Thank you. Um, here's one. Um, 
were the female students subjected to the outing system at Carlisle too? Yes, absolutely. Um, thanks for that question. Um, so uh, female students were most often assigned uh, to, rather than to kind of the farm labor, uh, they were assigned more specifically to domestic work. Um, so they were often assigned to households in cities like Philadelphia or to other kind of towns um, where, you know, it, I mean, in theory, of course, from the vantage point of school officials, they were supposed to be learning certain things and going to public school. Um, and of course, their experiences varied from family to family, but a lot of them re recalled and reported on all the hard work they had to do. Um, and that was one of the problems <laughs> that colonial officials, US officials I'm thinking of here, faced in terms of the return of Apaches to their communities is these, these students, so to speak, would come back and say, hey, you just are gonna, if you go to Carlisle or you go to Hampton Institute, which was another school in Virginia or wherever else, you're gonna be put to hard labor. And so this made it difficult uh, for the US to recruit more students to go. And, and of course they then instead sometimes forcibly uh, sent the kids, or I, I shouldn't even say kids, they forcibly sent um, the students to go. Um, because another interesting dynamic here, uh, which I may not have highlighted enough, is that it wasn't just children who were sent to the boarding schools. Sam Kanoy was 25 when he was sent. Uh, and that's not unusual that they were in their 20s or even early 30s when they were sent to places like Carlisle. One, another question was, um, what year did Spain make it illegal to have slaves? And I guess uh, my own follow-up to that question is like, what difference did that make um, for the Apache or, or in the Southwest? Yeah, great. Um, that's a great question. Um, so I, it's complicated, but I mean, the simple answer, I'd say two things. One is that um, from very early on in Spanish colonization, the enslavement of indigenous peoples was controversial. Um, and in part, that was because Spanish colonization was justified um, from the vantage point of the Catholic Church, especially by the idea that they were going to Christianize indigenous people. Uh, and it was controversial whether enslavement uh, was a, <laughs> a, the right strategy for, for Christianization. Um, so it was controversial from the start. Uh, but from the start, um, specific indigenous groups that resisted Spanish colonization from, and I'm speaking here, of course, from the Spanish mindset, uh, were often deemed enslavable. Um, so in the Caribbean, it's the Caribs. Uh, in New Spain, it's the Chichimecos, and the Apaches kind of get labeled like that as an enslavable group. Um, but in the 1540s, there's um, what are termed the new laws um, that are passed, where uh, the enslavement of indigenous peoples is much more restricted. And if you read the text, it makes it sound like just a blanket prohibition on Indian enslavement. But what happened in practice is that in particular regions, in some cases, there were exceptions, kind of official exceptions made based on kind of dynamics on the ground. Colonists would say, we just have to be allowed to enslave uh, these Mapuches or these Apaches, uh, if we're going to be successful in our in our efforts, and then even setting aside the law entirely, the kind of cultural idea that specific kinds of people were enslavable persisted despite the law. So the idea that non-Christian enemies were enslavable that continues on you know, throughout Spanish colonization and into the Mexican national period and, you know, into after the US-Mexico war. Um, so that's a really interesting dynamic in terms of, terms of Indian slavery that's somewhat different than the enslavement of people of African descent is the kind of legal controversies. Um, but um, in places like what's now New Mexico and Colorado, um, whatever the law was kind of I, I think we can say got set aside by these, uh, the kind of cultural sanction for Indian enslavement that was persistent and ongoing. And um, probably time for maybe just one more question quickly. Um, why did the Spanish call the people of the Arkansas River um, Los Cuartelejos? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So the court the the, the word portalejo referred to kind of the um, the the pal I'm trying to think of the right translation, but it's kind of like the um, there some of these uh, Apache villages on the plains were actually um, fortified, um, and um, they were they lived uh, in addition to um, the settlements themselves actually being uh, fortified. Um, the Spanish were struck by the fact that they they lived in um, uh, in houses. Uh, so particularly in uh, southern Colorado, they described them being made out of adobe often, uh, which is a reflection of the kind of intercultural interactions that existed between Apaches and other indigenous peoples in the region, right? Where uh, the tradition of adobe structures is, uh, didn't originate among Plains Apache people, but it, it's, it's uh, something that they likely learned from their interactions with, with Puebloan people and it, it then incorporated into their, their settlements. Uh, but that's where the, the, the uh, Cortalejos name comes from, is from these kind of uh, garrisoned uh, settlements that they encountered um, uh, out out, out on the plains that that to them were were unexpected. They they expected to 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 find um, you know they expected to find nomads so to speak right um, that uh, lived in temporary shelters and they were surprised to find these fixed sedentary uh, I mean at least permanent uh, settlements that were garrisoned and so on. And I would just point out, I'm happy to answer more questions. I don't want to take up more of uh, the moderator's time, but um, if others want to hang out and have questions, I'm, I'm happy to moderate and answer any questions. I don't, I don't have to go right now. <laughs> well, are there, um, we want to be mindful of everyone's time here. Um, I know we had marked a few I, I see a comment uh, that um, I can I can address. I, it looks like I see it maybe from Nancy Ray about Sam was given a white name, forced to be removed, and had to fight his whole life. Um, I would just uh, that that comment kind of strikes me because um, that's that's absolutely absolutely true. You know, even in thinking about the name, you know, that I know him by, right? Where he didn't recall, he didn't remember his Apache name. Um, and the story of how he got his name is interesting and I won't belabor you with it. Um, but that was a part of the experience for many indigenous peoples of going to boarding school is, you know, receiving this new name, right? Um, uh, uh, you know, for many Apaches, that's when they first got a last name, which was, uh, it was often the name of a leader in their group. So like uh, Chato or Geronimo or, you know, but anyway, these are absolutely, you know, often, you know, colonial ascriptions, it's a, it's a loss, as Nancy is saying, of their cultural identity. Um, and I certainly uh, wasn't wanting to minimize that in talking about um, his story. I absolutely agree. Uh, it's a tragic story, but I think it's also a story about uh, persistence and resilience. Uh, and that's something I wanted to highlight too. Well, Dr. Conrad, um, we appreciate your time this evening. Um, it looks like there are, you know, lots of uh, comments in the in the chat box, um, but I don't see a whole lot more questions. So I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for offering your your research with us and uh, the generosity of your time. I want to thank everybody who joined us this evening, particularly those that were able to share um, personal insight um, and feedback. You know, during the conversation that always makes. Uh, these conversations much deeper and richer. And hopefully uh, that's one of the reasons why we hope to uh, be able to do these things in person uh, again at some point in the future to be able to, to carry on that dialogue uh, throughout. Um, our fall 2021 Borderlands of Southern Colorado speaker series will be announced later this summer. Tonight was the last program in our spring series. Um, you can find information at our website uh, when that information becomes available at historycolorado.com or I'm sorry, historycolorado.org. As a reminder, you can support our History Color support History Colorado by uh, pre-ordering Paul's book or by purchasing other Borderlands titles from our bookshop. Um, History Colorado does see receive a benefit from every purchase through our bookshop site. Uh, 
Um, thank you to the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area, Colorado State University Pueblo, and to all of our donors and supporters um, for continuing to support public programming at all History Colorado Community Museums. Thank you all and have a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Conrad.